All right, so this morning I'm going to stick a, we're, we're going to continue in our series, I'm going to stick a song in your head. You like that? A song in your head for the title. Now some of you, before I stick this song in your head, let's pray because, you know, I have to go heathenistic before I go. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that the interest of your word gives and brings life and light. And so, Father, we just thank you for what's already transpired. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the anointing of God that's upon your word this morning. And I thank you that you'll help me and assist me and teach through me that there be eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive in Jesus' name. And so, as I was putting this this message together, I, you know, I'm always trying to think of titles. Titles equal content, but yet titles also catch attention. And so I was trying to come up with something really catchy. And I just, just had this one song going through my head. Now, some of you aren't even going to recognize the band, but if you were around in the 80s, maybe. But it's the Steve Miller Band. Steve Miller. And he had this song that says, Time keeps on ticking, ticking into the future. Right? There's the title. So as we're talking about the subject matter this morning, I want you to be singing this song in your head. Time keeps on ticking. Well, better not do that. Time keeps on ticking, right? And some of you, like me, we look in the mirror now and we realize that time's kept on ticking. (laughs) David said, I was once young, but now I'm old. Time kept on ticking for him too. And he said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging for bread. For those of you that are young, I have good news for you. There's coming a day, one day you're going to be old. -er. You'll look in the mirror and realize you've become your grandparents. Hallelujah. It's just a part of the progression of life. And so I, I, I remember my grandparents being my age. Glory to God. We won't say anything more. So this morning, we're going to look at how... Um, time keeps on ticking and it just keeps moving forward. No matter what we do, we can't stop time. And so, I don't know why they've got to give you all these options every time you want to do something on your watch. 100, 100 options. I just want to push a button and go. So, when we look at how time keeps on ticking, within the series of, uh, uh, that we're looking at, Dream Killers, we're looking at God has a plan, a will, and a purpose for your life. And there's certain times of preparation, and then there's times that preparation ended, and it's, we are now into action. So, as a, again, there's always a time uh, to pray, and then there's a time to act. And as we've looked at Joshua, we're going to see again this morning how It was the same thing for him. Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spake to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, and said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan to the river, the land that I'm giving them. Notice this, what he said, the time has come. The time has come. For some of you sitting here this morning, I want to declare to you, your time has come. You may not know it yet, but your time has come. So when we look at Joshua and Moses, Joshua had been serving Moses approximately 40 years as his associate, some translations as ministers. And as that assistant, he had probably seen and heard many things while he was part of this legendary man's life. And everything that, that had been used by the Lord to shape and mold Joshua during this time through Moses, it was to develop him to, into the faithful leader in which he had already, that he was becoming. And when God said, arise, when God said, arise, what he was declaring was his time of preparation was now over. And the next step was to get up and get moving, which that, even though the preparation had ended, he was still stepping into another phase or another aspect of of his life, and that was action. It was time to get up and get moving, and we're going to see how Joshua sees the opportunity. 
So this morning, let me ask you a question. What is God preparing you to do? What is God preparing you to do? I mean, pastor, what is God preparing me to do? Well, that's a great question. What is he? Do you know the answer? Do you know the answer to that question? Do you know what God is preparing you to do? Or are you just kind of like hanging out, waiting for God to show you something? Um, I'm sorry. David, come up here, please. Take that back to the sound booth, please. Um, so what's, do you know what God's preparing you to do? What's the next step? Is this your golden moment in which God is telling you to arise? Is your time of preparation come to an end? And so if so, is it time for you to get up and get going? Is it time for you to get up and get moving? So this morning we're going to look at how there comes a time to arise, just like with Joshua. When preparation is over and the position you've been praying for is now a reality. Some of you have been praying for God, use me, use me, use me, use me. And God says, all right, arise. And you're saying, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. I don't want to do that. But it's time for you to get up and arise. Thank you. Arise to do what? Arise to do what God is asking you to do. And to do that, you're going to have to break out of your comfort zone and step into the great unknown. <laughs> With God, sometimes you just got to step out. We don't like to step out. We like to be in the comfortability. But see, here's, here's the unique thing is that you're the only one that can answer God's invitation to arise and embrace the moment that you're walking into. You can arise and embrace it or you can deny it. And if God has instructed you to start a new assignment now, then now is his perfect timing. So, so often as a pastor, I hear this, oh, I'm just waiting on God. I'm just waiting on it when it's perfect. I'm just waiting on when everything's all set in place. But sometimes God's waiting on you just to step out so he can set things in place. Notice God's prophetic word to Joshua. He said this, and Joshua 1 and verse 2 says, Therefore the time has come to lead these people. This was Joshua's prophetic word from the Lord that effectively launched him into what we would consider full-time ministry. How would you receive a word like that from God? See, this was Joshua's point of no return. Because the time of preparation had now come to an end, and it was time for him to act. I mean, how be it far? I mean, he didn't have much of a choice. Moses was dead. <laughs> what are you going to do now, Joshua? Arise. Arise into the place that God has called you to stand. There are things in your life, just because like in Joshua, Moses was dead. There's things in your life that are now dead. It's time for you to arise. Preparation is over. It's time for you to step out and to move forward and to get into the flow of the Almighty One and receive the blessings of the action that God has called you to do. Too often we're waiting in the background for God. And God has spent years preparing some of us. And it's time now to step into the forefront. Just like Joshua, he came to a place of no return and he had a choice. And his choice was to act now. And after all those years of dreaming about what it would be like to be the leader of the Israelites, the spotlight finally then shifted to jo jo Joshua in a moment's time. We would say it today's vernacular, and suddenly, and suddenly, he became the new Moses. And emotionally, I, I would have to think he must have felt a bit panicked inside, thinking, it's finally happened. I don't know. I mean, I'm just drawing off my own wisdom of how it would feel like all of a sudden, you know, I went from being in a position of assistance and helping to all of a sudden, now I've been thrust into the spotlight to be the leader of a multi-million 
group of people. And so again, Joshua's at a point of no return. Maybe he might have had some thoughts like you do when he steps into this position. It finally happened. It's here. It's no longer a dream. <laughs> because of that, what do I do? What do I do? Because now I'm the new Moses. But I can't be Moses because I, I don't have, yes, I've been trained by Moses. I have some of his leadership capabilities, but I'm not Moses and I don't have the personality of Moses. I am me. So you have to be you wherever God has called you to be and don't be somebody else or who has stood in that position. Just be you. So can you guess what Joshua w wished he could have done? He probably wished at this point in time, like many of us, that he could go back and talk to Moses and get a little more advice, right? I can't tell you how many times that, there, that since my parents have departed this earth and gone to live in heaven, how many times I would like maybe just to communicate with them and get some advice from them. Because my dad, you know, they were pretty wise people in a lot of areas. But more so, it was just you want to talk to them. And just have that assurance and have that, you know, it's going to be all right because you're shaking in your little boots from time to time because of what God has called you to do. In your own self, you may not believe you can do it. In your own self, you don't believe that, that, that God's got the right person. In your own self. But notice this, something again, my, that, that when we are weak, he is strong. God doesn't call you to do something that he doesn't empower you to do. And so if he's calling you to do something, he's going to empower you to gain the knowledge to do it correctly. Whether it's through education, whether it's through implication, whether it's through, you know, uh, mentorship, he will get you to a place where you will be prepared to stand in that place when it's time. You may not think you're ready. You know, in an afternoon session with Moses, we see that Joshua now has gone from hanging out with Moses where he's now the leader. What an impossible dream to go from assistant to head dog in just a matter of days. Joshua's mentor was dead and all the responsibility of leading the Israelites was now resting on one person's shoulder. No longer Moses, but Joshua's. And there Joshua, there Joshua was standing in the shoes of Moses with millions and millions of eyes fixed on him. What are you going to do now? 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 And undoubtedly the Israelites were most likely... Now, I wasn't there. I can't bring, you know, whether it is or truth or not, but I have to make this assumption that they were probably comparing him to Moses as well, right? That's just natural, natural humanistic traits. Well, what's he going to be like? Is he going to be, can he, can he lead us like Moses? Can he do what he did like Moses did? You know, Moses led us out of Egypt. Moses parted the Red Sea. Oh, my goodness. Can he do what Moses did? Does he have what it takes? At the same time, Joshua's probably thinking, will I ever be able to handle all that this position requires? <clears throat> now, in light of what the Lord spoke to him in the first few verses of chapter 1, it's safe to say then that Joshua had some doubts and fears coming against him. Yet at, at his point of no return where he couldn't turn around, he chose to step up to the plate and say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. I'm ready to do what you've been preparing for me to do. Here I am. How many of you say that? Here I am, Lord. I'm ready to do what you've prepared me to do. <coughs> I'm ready. To, or, Lord, I'm not ready. You got the wrong duck here. I'm not ready. We have to take, as we say in text, we have to take the bull by the horns. We have to just take control of the situation, whether we're ready or not. Whether I don't want to say it that way. Whether we feel ready or not. Because 
many times we don't feel ready. You see, God was calling Joshua to a new place of commitment. And if he was going to obey God and take on the assignment God has set before him, it would require something of him. Just like it's going to require something of you. And that is you have to put aside your fears, questions, doubts, and insecurities in order to move forward into a new realm of faith and courage. We all have moments of times of insecurities. We all have moments of, uh, of doubt. And un, in, in the word doubt is an uncertainty. Uncertain. Did you really call me to do this? Are you really sure you got the right duck for the pond? But as we, as we look at this, it requires that we put aside our fears. You know, I, I can almost rest assured in this thought that the Holy Spirit is likely training you right now and has been preparing you for a long, long time for a position of greater responsibility influence in His kingdom. God just doesn't sit on His laurels and, you know, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do with, with you. He's preparing us. He's training us because He has provision, call, and responsibility for us to step into. All your past experience and all the time and energy you've been exerting will eventually be called upon for what you're about to do. All the past is not just idle time. You're in preparation for separation for the call that God's called you to. God is moving in your life. He's not sitting still. He is moving in your life. And it's time to deal with fears, doubts, questions, and push yourself beyond the line that God has asked you to cross in order to do what he's asked you to do. It's time to step up. Time to step out. And you may feel a little, uh, little trepidation and fear. But you know what? You're going to be excited when you finally pass the point of no return and step into what God has called you to do. When you see how bright your future really is. So again, there comes a, a, a time to arise, just like with Joshua. And once God jolted Joshua with the reality that Moses was dead, he then said to him in verse 2, Therefore, the time has come. Your time has come. This was Joshua's moment to leave the season of mourning and move forward by faith into, the, into his predestinated or predestined future. The clock could not be turned back, not even for one second. And as scary as it may have been, for Joshua, he needed to trust the Lord and grab a hold of what was in front of him. To do what God is asking you to do, you will have to break free of your comfort zone and step out into what we call the great unknown. Now, what is that? Well, whether it's witnessing to your neighbor or moving across the world to preach the gospel, Taking steps of faith makes you feel as though you're living on the edge. That I'll guarantee you. And what's interesting, though, is although it may seem a bit scary at first, after you've lived on the edge for a while, <laughs> you'll go, you, you just begin to grow accustomed to the daily life an adventure of experiencing the powers of Jesus Christ. And you wonder why it took you so long to get there. Man, it's like adrenaline junkies. They, they got to do all this stuff because they got to have that adrenaline. Well, when you live for Christ and you're living on the edge, man, and it, it, you become accustomed to the daily life of adventure and experiencing the powers of Jesus Christ working in and through you. Man, you got, you need it. You, you got, I tell people sometimes I'm addicted to the anointing. I need it. I got to have it. I want more of it. When God told me the time had come to leave California to move to Oklahoma, as I told you the past couple of weeks, it was a very difficult time in my life. I was comfortable in my life and I was comfortable in my lifestyle. At that time, California was a good place for me to be living, but that was back in the 80s. 
when God told Pastor Kim and I we were going to pioneer a new church, the, the logistics of doing that, it was quite different and difficult. And I was moving out of, again, my comfortability zone. And to be quite honest, from a support team, from a support team where I was just a member of a support team, now I was moving into leadership. Then again in 2016, when I was moved from a secondary position in the leadership to a primary leadership role. And in one sense, it was difficult. It was difficult to step into, but I enjoy, as I enjoyed my role and responsibilities within the organization that I was a part of, and I was quite happy being number two. But here's the thing again, I want you to understand. I didn't come, I didn't, I didn't seek promotion. I didn't seek the leadership. I didn't seek the house. I sought the Lord. So I didn't promote myself, just like Joshua. He was happy, I'm sure, being the second man. He didn't promote himself, but one day he was promoted by God. One day I was promoted by God to stand in the position of the, the lead pastor, senior pastor, head pastor, or just the pastor. It doesn't matter. Whatever title you want to give me, I'm here. Lead food eater. I'm available. And if I can't eat all of it, I have, you know, Reverend Tim Brown, he's a young minister. He's on the starvation plan often. <laughs> Hallelujah. We bring him along. So I was at, again, a point of no return. I was serving and supporting another minister with a wealth of wisdom in the Word of God. I mean, Pastor Odell, he was, man... He was a good man. A lot of knowledge and wisdom in, in the Word of God, man. I'm still surprised at the people that through the years that, that he taught and they put, their, put what he taught into, into their lives. And we would be places and they, they'd say, you know, I was, I was going through this, but man, I went back to this teaching that you taught. And oh my goodness, it changed my life. I was able to hold on to the Word of God. I was able to make it through. That's what we're doing is we're putting the Word of God in you because it will not turn, return void. And so, as I served Pastor Odell, he always carried the load of the day-to-day -day cares of the ministry and where I didn't have to. I, didn't, I just came and served him and made sure, you know, we, we took care and paid the bills. We took care of everything. But he had to carry the daily pressures and the cares. Remember Paul said, above all else, I have, the, I have all this other stuff going on. And then I have the daily cares of the ministry. So on top of my household, I've got to believe God for this household. Amen. I believe God, not just for my children, but there are times that I'm having, I'm praying my, my morning routine and just going through life and God interrupts my, my morning routine of prayer to pray for one of you. How rude. <laughs> but I do it lovingly. What well, I mean, we're, we're they in trouble for now? What do they do now? What do they do now? No, it has nothing to do with that. God, sometimes we, you know, I thank God that, that people are praying for Pastor Kim and I right now because, you know, there's times where you're just going through things that you need that support and prayer will bring an increase of the grace of God in your life because you, if nothing else, somebody says, I'm praying for you. Man, that's just, thank you so much. I need that. Just to know God loves me enough that he has people praying for me. So again, you know, with Pastor Odell, if the, if, if the bills were late, it was not my monkey or not my circus. However, I would stand with him through prayer and provide valuable resources and information that he could make the wisest decisions possible at that time. I advised and gave him counsel. However, again, he was the pastor and he was the final authority. But notice that all the time now, you know, I came from, I came from, Kim and I pastored His Grace Church in 1998. We, we, we ran the church for almost a decade. When John Michael was born, we, we kind of drew back and we, because he, he had some physical issues. It, it, it was just almost too much. So we, we closed the church, went, went into itinerant ministering and eventually came to work for Pastor Odell. 
And there came a time in 2016, now, it wasn't like he hadn't warned me. He kept telling me all of 2016 privately, he says, I, I'm thinking of retiring. I'm thinking of retiring. Well, don't. And there were a couple times I, I asked him, because, you know, if you're going to retire, it'd be nice if I'd know so I could kind of prepare. And he just couldn't, he just couldn't really kind of get it clear in his spirit. He, he, the Lord would just deal with him about this, but he just he couldn't get it clear. And in September of that year, I asked him again, look, you know, if you're going to retire at the end of this year, like you've been talking about, we need a transition. We need a, you know, transition plan. And, you know, it's like sometimes when you talk to people, well, never mind <laughs> about funerals, you know, they don't want to talk about their own funeral. <laughs> right? And so he just, it made him uncomfortable to think about retiring and, and moving into something else that God had for him. And, and so I kind of let it go. I figured I, I'm happy, you're happy, let's just keep doing what we're doing. And um, we had a service here in, in December, of no, the last weekend of November of 2016. And, and I, I you know, the Holy Ghost was moving. There were words that were given prophetically. And, you know, that was it. And the next Sunday he came to me and uh, he said, well, I'm retiring in three weeks. You want the church? I said, well, it's not my decision. We have to take it before the people. And if they'll agree to it, I will, I will take and, and pastor the church. But it, then he says, but you can't call it this church, because the board of directors says I have to take all the legal entities. So you have like three weeks to set up a nonprofit corporation and get everything and <laughs> I'm going. Three weeks is not enough time. However, we got a corporation already set up. It's nonprofit, 501c3. Why? Because God had already, we had done it originally. And then during the time we were down, God had me take and get all the IRS papers done and finished out all the process so that we weren't just recognized by the state. We are now recognized by the federal government. And see, that was a time and a season of preparedness. But then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I reached this point of no return. And for those eight years that I worked for Pastor Odell, he was also preparing me. He was also healing me. He was also restoring me. There had been taken some things that had taken uh, just before I came to work for him that had, had, had really just affected me very deeply. And so I was being prepared for this major point of no return. And in 2014, I have it in my notes, the Lord told me, his grace church must rise from its ashes. Now, those aren't words that I really wanted to hear because I was happy. Sometimes, sometimes God, you make decisions that are not of the will of God. And it creates consequences. The moment that I closed the doors to His grace church, I knew what I did was wrong. But now it's too late. It's, and so it took 10 years for me to walk back into the place where God had called me. But God began to pour into me through people. God began to pour into me and prepare me for this time. Because the day that we're standing in is the same place that I was standing in when I closed the church the first time. And so as, as we're walking through some serious things here at the church, you know, there's a part of me that just like you, um, when things get rough and tough, we want to cut bait and run. Right? It's easier just to give up and quit and go. And so the Lord was reminding me back in 2008, well, how that worked. He told me, how that worked for you? how that worked for you? Well, it didn't work well. He said, exactly. So you're going to stay and fight? You're going to cut bait and run? I said, well, I think this time around I'm going to stay and fight. And so in 2017, again, we reopened His Grace Church. And I, and I, again, in just three weeks, I go from being a secondary into a primary. And really, I didn't really have all that much time because he, Pastor Odell told me at about the first week, he said, I'm going to preach one more week and then you're going to start. I think you need to start taking Sunday mornings. I said, great. Now, about, a, about six, seven months earlier, 
I tell Pastor Kim because on the inside of me, see, I, I know that this, this time, this preparation time is ending. In fact, I told Pastor Kim, I said, look, um, God's called me to pastor. Now that's not words she wants to hear because the, sometimes when you do things for God and things don't work out just as great as what they're supposed to in your own mind and you, and you think of all the struggles and, the, and everything and the mess and the, you don't want to do it again. But you see, God didn't, he didn't forsake the plan. Thank God he didn't forsake the plan with Jesus. Jesus is going to be kind of tough. Hope you can make it. No, he empowered Jesus to do what he did. He'll empower you to do what you do, just like he's empowering Pastor Kim and I to do what we did. So that year I told her, I don't know how we're going to do it, whether we're going to leave and go start a church or whatever, but I know this time. She said, I know it's getting close. But she says, what? please take this cup from me. She told me flat out right, I don't want to do this again. The first time was bad enough. But you know, if we don't, if we quit and we don't get back up, then we will never see the fulfillment of the plan, the purpose that God called us to. And so many times though, when, when God does things, he does things in steps. So I'll give you an example. I had taken one step of faith when I left California and moved to Oklahoma. That was to begin this new adventure in God called ministry, work. And although it seemed quite frightening at the time, I arose just like Joshua, he arose and I stepped out in obedience. Now, I took another step of faith when we reopened His Grace Church in 2017. So there's points where you have to arise, the time of preparation is over and you have to step out and do. And the point is that each nudge by the Holy Spirit to step out in faith is His invitation for you to arise into what He's calling you to do. Sometimes it's a general leading of the Spirit. Sometimes God communicates in your dream. Sometimes, sometimes God speaks to you in an audible voice. Sometimes you just ain't listening and He needs to get your attention. So He has a multiplicity of ways. My, one of them is my wife. So, however God chooses to do it, I prefer to be led by that still small voice instead of the booming voice <laughs> on the other end. So, but then as you take one step, and then another step, and another step, then it forms, it just forms into a firm foundation for you to walk on, and it makes it easier, it makes it easier for you to take the next step. As I look back over 40 years of serving God and working with the Lord, I now can see that each time that gentle nudge came to step out and then follow through, uh, through obedience, then how those steps then built a firm foundation that has allowed me to stand and do what I do today. Which is again to serve you in the capacity of a pastor. If I or Pastor Kim had not risen and taken all those smaller steps of obedience, it's most likely that God would not have trusted us with the assignment that we now have. What's God asking you? What's God entrusting you to do? Today, he's using Pastor Kim and I uh, to teach his word here in the United States, Europe, in the farthest ends of the world, through this local body. You say, well, how's that possible, Pastor? We, you're here every Sunday. Yes, I am here. But you see all these cameras? They're going worldwide. And it is our, our vision to take the gospel, that gospel of power and truth, into a generation, into a world of darkness. And with the, with the infusion of electronics and internet, we can go a lot farther. You know, when, when we first started the church, we didn't have any capability for uh, video. In fact, video was, man, only for rich people. And so, but MP3s were first coming out. Websites were just starting. Now with Pastor Kim being in the realm of, of systems engineer and development in computers, we built, we, we were one of the first churches within our organization to have a website. In fact, people began to come and ask us how to do it. And so, but 
one of the things that I did do that it was in my heart was to put our, our messages online. MP3s was all that was available online. And then I didn't want to put it out there so that, oh, I could be lifted up and, and you know, ooh, there's Pastor Mike. I put it out there because I wanted to reach into places that people didn't have what we were giving. They didn't have the food in which we were eating. And you know, after about six, seven years, that particular site, that, that site, we were getting almost 10,000 hits a month before we took it down. Now with the infusion of video, you know, everybody's got something to say. So the question isn't what's next. I mean, what's next for us? Only God knows. So let me ask you this, this question. What's your next step of faith? What's your next step in the leap of faith? Is the Holy Spirit asking you to leave your current job or to accept a new one with greater responsibilities? Is he prompting you to start a business that you've always dreamed of starting? Have you, have you met your man or woman of the dreams? <laughs> and you know God wants you to marry them and say yes to that lifelong commitment? Do you sense the Spirit of God pushing you? <laughs> Sorry. Red's a new color in the back. <laughs> Do you sense the Spirit of God wants you to push your fears aside to share Christ with your neighbor or unsaved family member? Or do you feel it's time to step out in faith to answer God's call in your life or maybe even your ministry? If you answer yes to these questions or any of these questions, it's going to take a big step of faith. We're all at different phases and places in our lives, so it's not wise to compare our walk with someone else. Comparisonitis is not, a, is not something we want to enter into. We want to be uniquely ourselves in what God has called us to do and then be comfortable in what God has called us to do with who we are. And so what's important then is that we each continue to arise and move forward into the future that God has marked out for us individually. And if you're stuck in a rut, you're just going to stay right where you are. That's a good title to the sermon, isn't it? Stuck in a rut. You can have that one for free. <laughs> stuck in a rut. Or you're going to break out of the stale status quo and you're going to embark on the great adventure, and it is a great adventure that, adventure that God has planned for you and what he's planned for your life. You're the only one that can answer God's invitation to arise and embrace that moment. And perhaps you've received a word from the Lord already, revealing something new that you are to do with your life. But instead of obediently... Uh, following his instructions, you are waiting for the circumstances to be absolutely perfect before you step out and obey. I've never been there. <laughs> Amen? We're all like that. But here's the sobering truth. The situation and circumstances will never be perfect. It's like somebody, I've heard this time and time again, somebody's looking for the perfect church. They're looking for the perfect pastor, right? That's why they can't come to this church because we're not perfect and the pastor's not perfect. Well, I got good news for you. The moment you walked into the church, it became imperfect. Why is that? Because we're all imperfect. There was only one perfect person. He's dead. They crucified him. And so, Situations and circumstances will never be perfect. Consider again the life of Joshua. When God told him to lead the Israelites across the Jordan River, it was what? At flood stage. It was at flood stage. It wasn't... Uh... I didn't see that. That squirrel. <laughs> squirrel, yeah. Clearly, clearly for Joshua... In Joshua's life, all of a sudden to take the reins of an organization when 
it was the worst possible time to lead people across the river because it was overflowing its banks. It's not a good time to start a ministry. And again, many like to say they're waiting for the perfect timing of the Lord before they make a move. What would have happened if Josh was waiting for the waters to recede? And to be honest with you, when we use that excuse, we're just waiting for the perfect timing. We're waiting on the Lord. What is that? That's nothing but just a poor excuse to avoid taking any real action. That's all it is. Let's be honest with ourselves. But then don't let that describe who you are. If God's instructed you to start a new assignment now, then now is the perfect time, not tomorrow. Perfect conditions don't necessarily mean perfect timing. What is perfect timing? Perfect timing is when God says, arise and do it now. That's perfect timing. And indeed, there comes a moment in all of our lives and we no longer need to pray about the future. We just need to arise and do it now. What does that mean? We just need to arise and act. So are we disregarding prayer? Absolutely not. There's a time to pray, but there's also a time to act. And Joshua didn't need to stop and say, Lord, let me pray about this new assignment to lead the nation of Israel. It may take me a few days, but let me just get it clear in my spirit. Let me make sure I got this right. Because I definitely want to make sure that the timing is absolutely perfect for me to step into this role. But notice this. He'd already spent decades training and praying for his opportunity. And when this point of no return came into his life, he was ready. And the only action required now was obedience. And that's why God said this. Now, therefore, arise. This morning, there's a time to pray. There's a time to act. In the winter of 2016, we were still praying about pastoring. But you know, there came a place where Pastor Kim and I no longer had to pray because we knew it was God's will to pastor. And when, when the opportunity to arise and, and, and act came, we didn't have to... Oh, when Pastor Odell said, what do you want to do? Well, I already knew that I was to pastor. I already knew that God had called me, that it was just... So I didn't have to pray, Lord, do you want me to pastor or not? What we did do is always we did come before the church at that time and said, look, here's the transition that's taking place. Do you want to continue? It's up to you. I was going to pastor either way because God had called me to pastor. The decision I had already made was to pastor. Just where were we going to pastor was the deciding factor. So the wisdom of knowing when to do each whether to pray or to act will directly determine whether you are successful or not. Sadly, many believers, sadly, many believers confuse the two and end up praying a lot more than necessary without ever accomplishing anything in their lives because they're too busy praying for the perfect time. So it's vital then to know when to quit praying and to start taking action. And what God does is often unprecedented in our lives. You know, I'll give you an example. I heard a story, of, uh, uh, Rick Renner told this story some time ago. And I thought, it, I thought it was good for this particular time frame. And he said that when they began their television ministry many, many years ago in, in the former Soviet Union, he said something quite remarkable happened. Number one, for starters, no one ever had a nationwide TV ministry in the former Soviet Union. Not ABC, NBC, not CBS, no one. Broadcasting the gospel at the time was illegal and off limits. 
And so now what they were doing is they were doing something that was brand spanking new. And surprisingly enough, one day he, get, he got a call from a journalist who, who said this. He said, hey, he said, I got a contact in Kiev. And if you'll meet me there, I believe a door will open for you to broadcast your teachings to the entire nation of Ukraine. Now, Rick said that was one of the breakthroughs his team had been praying for. He simply loved Ukraine and had continued to ask God to give him a way to speak to the entire nation. So, flying to Kiev to meet the journalist didn't require additional prayer. It now required action. And, and when he arrived with his assistant, they met this journalist and they also met the television director of the largest channel in Ukraine, which was the man who controlled everything. He controlled it all. And he said, Mr. Renner, we've been watching your programs and today we're going to give you an opportunity we've never given anyone else. He then put a contract in front of him and said, if you're willing to sign this and pay this price, we'll put you on the biggest channel enabling you to reach every single home in the Ukraine. Now, as he said, clearly when something like this happens, it's a God thing. See, God was opening a great door of opportunity in front of them that no man could open. Just imagine. These were people who had never heard the regular teaching of the Bible. This was an unprecedented opportunity for the light of God's Word to be, again, penetrating the darkness of Ukraine. And in that moment, Rick looked at the director, he said, in the eyes, he said, can you just give us a minute, please? Can you just give us a minute? And he proceeded to walk out of the room with his assistant, and he said, I turned to my assistant and I said, I'm going to sign that contract. And his assistant very quickly and nervously reminded him of this one point. We don't have the money to pay for this. And he said, and it was true. They didn't. The assistant said, well, I think we should take a little time to pray about it. But Rick said that he knew that it was not the time to pray, it was now time to act. The door had opened, which Rick, which was, was God's way for, of saying to, to Rick Renner, arise, step forward, take it, this door I'm opening for you. Now, Rick goes on to tell the story that he knew that if he had asked for a week to think about it, most likely the TV executive would have changed his mind and the opportunity would have been lost. So the moral of the story is this, seize the moment. You know, when Pastor Odell decided to retire, as I said earlier, it was a surprise for us. But the Lord had already been dealing with Pastor Kim and I about returning to a leadership role as a pastor. And so when that opportunity came, we didn't have to spend extra hours praying about the situation. I already knew what to do and said yes with the contingent, again, that the membership would be behind us. They would be all right with it. Seven years I worked along, alongside Pastor Odell, earning his trust and friendship. And you know, I believe we were a good team. However, just because he wanted to do something like turn the church over, it was, it was not his choice. The people, the membership had a say in it. And seven years, I believe, I earned by working for him that I earned the trust of the membership of that time. Because without trust, you can't do what God's called you to do. God's got to be able to trust you as well. So, before the promotion, there was years of faithfulness to serve the man of God that I was called and submitted to. Maybe that's true for you as well. 
There were years of faithfulness to serve the membership where I was called to as well. For them to follow after a young man, after a, a leader who they most of them have been part of for over 30 years that he's been in their life, there had to be trust from the Lord that I could pick up the mantle and run with it just as he had. Time and grade, time and service, I had to prove not only to myself that I could do the job, but that I also had the experience to handle the difficult situations again. It's always easier when somebody else is running the ship. Indeed, time is very precious, so don't waste it. Don't disregard the time of preparation as unimportant. But again, we must learn to take action at the right, when the time is right. And if the door that you've been patiently waiting and praying for has supernaturally opened and God gives you the green light, then most assuredly, go for it. You may be nervous or have butterflies in your stomach about taking the first step. I say that's normal. There's an old song, don't worry, be happy, right? Because you're about to step into, you're about to step out in faith and do something you've never done before. So don't let your apprehensions and nervousness keep you from achieving the wonderful things that God has prepared for you to do. And those first steps of faith only look huge because you've never taken them before. But once you've moved into the realm of faith to accept your new assignment with God, you will realize that making that critical first move wasn't so difficult after all when you look back. Just as God, just as God was waiting for you to respond to his invitation, he's saying this to you this morning, arise, arise, it's a new season. Your Moses is dead. The past is gone, and there's no turning back. Now you have a choice. You can either camp around the dead memory of what used to be, or you can say, that was a blessed time in the past, but I'm going to move on to the next season. You know, when we closed His Grace Church, we had some glorious times in the first part of the first 10 years that we pastored. We had glorious times. We created some great memories. But if I still am camped around there, camped about what was. I'll never be looking forward. There's generations that are camped around moves of God that are history, but they haven't moved into the move of God. So now is the time for you to step out in faith and move forward. And if you'll move into your new season, you'll experience the phenomenal power of God as a new adventure, as it begins to unfold in your life. When Joshua accepted God's invitation, miracles began to happen right in front of him, and that's what will happen with you as well. God is the God of miracles. So time is precious. Don't waste it. If God says, arise now, it means it's time for you to take action. So let me ask you this question. Have you ever come to a place in your life when you knew your present season was ending and it was time to move on. Oh, the, the uncertainty, the difficult, you know, feeling, the, the, the inward feeling like I don't belong here, but I don't know where. It's just, there's seasons. And when one season, it's like when the fall ends and the winter begins, it, it's not just like, you know, one day. Now, up north, it used to be like one day. You know, one day you're in your, your shorts and the next day you're shoveling snow. <laughs> right? You knew there was an instamatic. But down here, you know, one day you could be in your shorts and the next day you're still shoveling snow. But there's always a de definitive time when the season changes. So recognize when you're in a season of change and recognize when that time has come to an end and then arise. Take action to propel yourself into the next place. Look back over the past f phases of spiritual growth in your life. And if you'll do that, ask yourself, can you clearly see how God used people, places, and circumstances to prepare you for where you are now? Is there anything really you could have had skipped then 
that you thought then that you could have skipped, but you know now that how necessary it was for you to walk through that. Is God calling you to a new place of commitment today? If so, it's going to require you to put aside your fears, questions, doubts, insecurities in order for you to move forward into the new realm of faith and courage. I encourage you to take a few moments to, with yourself to share with God the thoughts and concerns that maybe have been weighing you down mentally and emotionally. And as an act of your will, let him have all your worries and cares, for he's always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. That's what he does. You know, one of the last, we'll look at this next week, but one of, the la one of the first things God told Joshua, be strong. He told him to arise and go. And then he said, fear not, be strong, be of good courage, for I'm the Lord your God. This morning, whatever God is calling you to do, whatever place or position he's placing you in, Know that he's already prepared the way. We're going to have to walk through it with faith. We're going to have an enemy that's going to try to destroy us. But thank God for the blood of Jesus that protects us. Arise. Stand in your place. Stand in your ground and run your race. For there is grace. There is grace and empowerment from heaven to do what you've been called to do. So don't shuck away. Don't, don't step out. But stay in that place and begin to declare what the Word of God says, and that is, you win. You win. The victory is mine. The victory is mine. The victory is mine. So stand up and declare what God said. Stand up and declare His Word. Speak to the princes and the powers of the air of how great your God is and what He will do. And don't let fear stand in the way of what God has already prepared you to do. You may not feel ready. You may not seem ready. You may not act ready. But when God says you're ready, you're ready. That doesn't mean it's perfect sailing. If you look at all the apostles, I mean, Paul went on to tell about all the beatings that he was, cruci not crucified, but he was, he was stoned to death once. He was whipped. He was... I mean, shipwrecked. He was bitten by snakes. As um, Reverend Tim said earlier, you know, he was beaten by the enemy, spiritually speaking. And what did God say? My grace, my power is made mature. Hallelujah. So he said, I'm not going to glory in my infirmities. I'm not going to glory in my, my, my weaknesses. I'm going to look to him. This morning, God's called you out. Stepping into a new place. Stepping into a new place. Stepping into a new place. God's called you to step into that new place. Arise and begin to run your race. You may not have the full picture, but that's okay. If you'll step out and get obedient, He'll lead you in the way. He'll teach you. He'll prepare you. When's the time when it's perfect? The time is now. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that the entrance of your word gives and brings life. We thank you this morning that, Father God, you have a plan for each of us. And that plan starts with Jesus. If you're watching this broadcast or you're here in the house, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity, that free gift Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to me except through, no man can come to the Father except through me. Jesus also said, or Paul writing to the church at Rome, he said, in no way that if we call upon the name of the Lord would he cast us out. He tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 and 10 that if we'll declare with our mouth, confess, we'll declare with our mouth or confess with our mouth what we believe in our heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, we will be saved. This morning, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity. Just simply pray this prayer with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, become Lord of my life. I confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart. 
that you were raised from the dead. From this moment forward, I'm born again. I'm on my way to heaven. And I'm a new creation in Christ. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, I want to welcome you to the family of God. Something uniquely and wonderful is happening to you right now. And you may not understand it. You may not you know, but you just know something's changed. Something's different. I encourage you to do two things. Number one, find yourself a good Bible-believing church and get hooked up in that, that church so you can begin to grow and develop and in in, in mature in your Christian walk. Man, if you're in the San Antonio area, we believe that His Grace Church is such a place. You can find us on our, through our, our map on our, our website at www.hgc.church forward slash locations. We're in the far northwest part of town. If you're watching through any one of our social media devices, and um, we encourage you to find a local church in your community. We can help you. We can assist you with that. However, if you don't have a church and you're looking for a, a community of believers, to develop and grow with online, we'd be more than happy to have you as part of our online congregation until you find your home in your city. The second thing I encourage you to do is check out our website, at triple, our digital resources uh, on our website at www.hgc.church forward slash resources. Right at the top is the new birth, and it's going to be in a nutshell, um, just help you understand exactly what's happening, has happened to you when you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It is a very short series, about 10 videos long. Pastor Kim and I teach that. They average five to seven minutes, and it's just to help you understand exactly what has occurred in your life. Again, welcome to the family of God. Well, Amplify, Thursday night, man. Back to the basics on health and healing. Join us. One hour or less, which is the Bible study. Every Thursday night is our midweek instruction. And we get in the Word, and we learn, we grow, and develop. Whether you're with us on campus or whether you're watching online, all of our material is put out online, and you can watch it 24-7 through our digital resources page here at His Grace Church. Pastor Kim and I believe that God has something unique to say to you this week, and our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. Thank you for being a part of His Grace Church. Thank you for being a part of this uh, morning's Sunday morning worship celebration. We look forward to seeing you right back here again real soon. His Grace Church, a destination for divine visitations. I'm Pastor Michael Pilmore. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again real soon.